What is up you guys? Welcome to my YouTube channel. If you're new here, my name is Mackenzie. If you're not new, thank you for coming back. So today's video is going to be an easy video, something definitely different for my channel, but I'm so busy with the holiday season. So I wanted to do something a little bit easier for me and give you guys a chance to get your questions answered. So that's exactly what we're doing today. I asked you guys what your questions were, both on my Instagram and here on YouTube. So I've got a list full of questions, a cup of hot chocolate, this sounds like something you're into let's get started okay so very first question which I actually get asked frequently is how did I start stained glass so it's a funny story kind of random but just like with a lot of crafts and different things that I do I try it just one time and see how it goes and that's what was gonna happen with stained glass I wanted to make one specific piece which I will show you guys I'll pop up a picture here even though it's absolutely horrifying how bad it is okay guys this is it or what's left of it anyway please don't think of me differently like I said I know it's absolutely horrifying so bad look at that solder job basically just tinned but I didn't know anything didn't even have a grinder yet so it is what it is and I forgot to mention, this is actually the only piece of mine that I've ever kept. I never keep any of my work. This is the only piece I've ever kept because it was never intended for everybody, anybody else and obviously not good enough quality, but anything else I practiced on, I threw away. So this is my very first piece, the only piece I've ever kept. But I wanted to make this cauldron for Halloween. So I got the bare minimum basics on what I needed to make that piece of stained glass. It was a little cauldron and it used to have actually a bunch of firewood logs underneath it hanging from a chain and some bubbles coming out of the top which is quite adventurous i suppose for my first piece but point is i got the bare minimum basics i didn't even get a grinder which i actually didn't for a long time but i got i think a glass cutter running pliers foil and a wicked crappy soldering iron and i think that's everything that i got and some hand grinders so point is I made this piece or attempted to make this piece and as soon as I finished it, it was like something kind of just clicked in me where I knew that this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life it was just something that I suppose came natural to me and it was so much fun and again it was just something happened inside my mind where I was like oh my god this is it finally which is I'm almost 30 years old now, coming up on 29, so it's taken me until now to get that feeling finally, which I'm sure many people don't get at all during their life, so I'm grateful I did. Got that feeling, so I just went with it and started practicing. So I did as much stained glass as I possibly could. I was still working for my mother-in-law at this time, but I was making as much as I could on the side, just getting better. and. I decided I wanted to try to sell it online. So I opened an Instagram just so I could see what the feedback would be. And luckily I had quite a few friends that had bigger platforms on social media already who definitely helped me grow my following quickly. And I saw that the feedback was amazing. Everybody absolutely loved my designs. So I just kept pushing those out for those first couple weeks of making stained glass and opened my shop maybe three weeks after that. Opened my shop, everything slowly sold out and I just kept going with it. I made it as much as I could, practiced as much as I could, posted on Instagram as much as I could and it just grew and grew and grew and grew. I believe I quit my job within, definitely within that first two month frame, probably closer to one month time frame once I saw that I could sustain myself on making stained glass and taking custom work. So it was kind of an accident but again, as soon as I made that first piece, I knew it. I knew this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Okay, so question number two, what did I do before stained glass? Well, like I just said, I didn't have, uh, I never knew what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I dabbled in a lot of different things, like way back when I went to high school, I thought I wanted to be a mechanic, so I went to school and uh, was taught auto. Then once I left, I realized it just was something that was going to physically take a toll on my hands and on my body. So I left that, didn't pursue that longer than I think a year of working in this crappy shop. Then I kind of bounced around random jobs. A few years after that, I went to hairdressing school. Again, something I thought was going to be what I wanted to do forever, but that also took a toll on my body. Standing on your feet 
eight, nine, 10, 11 hours a day, even at my age, which I was around 25 when I did it, I knew there was no way I could sustain it. There's no way I'm gonna be able to do that for the rest of my life. So I kept looking and mind you, my husband, he's in the military, which is another question coming up, but we've been moving all over the place. And I think right after that is when we went to Boston and that's when I was working for AC Moore. So just like Michael's, there's a craft store in New England called AC Moore. And I worked there for maybe three or four years. And then that first year I started moving up. By the time I left, I was merchandising supervisor and I liked it a lot, but the pay just wasn't what I needed to be. Again, it was taking a toll on my physical and my mental health because I was working a lot. So I ended up quitting that job and working for my husband's mother. So my mother-in-law, she has always done um, drug testing and medical billing and coding. So luckily I was able to work for her, making good money and kind of making my own hours too, which is the first taste I had of working for myself which i knew is definitely something i was interested in i just didn't know how i was going to get there yet so worked for her i think on and off for quite a few years same thing with my husband when he wasn't doing military stuff but after boston for a couple years we ended up coming back to worcester that's when i found stained glass so random jobs till then just those random odd jobs that don't really mean anything to you until i found stained glass okay so next question, am I married, single, do I have children? So I'm married, I'm coming up on 29 years old. We've been married 10 years this July 30th. We got married when I was 18. So we've been married almost 10 years, no children, not yet at least anyway. I don't know if that's something we're going to be into. So for all the people that constantly ask, when are you gonna pop babies out? It's not really a question you wanna ask a stranger. So I don't know yet, we'll see. Been married 10 years, no children. So next question, where to find glass online? Another question that I get often, and this is so difficult to answer. It's difficult to answer for many reasons. So one, not only do I not buy glass online, but two, I wouldn't suggest it. So I know I'm luckier in the fact that I'm able to go in store to buy my stained glass. A lot of people don't have that option. But I would say if you do have that option, that's the route you wanna go. Even if it's an hour drive, two hour drive, whatever, make those big bulk trips and avoid shopping online. It's going to be so much more expensive just in general, never mind taxes, shipping, all that stuff that gets tacked on top of it from wherever you're buying from. I just find online it is so much more expensive, especially if you're not doing it for just a hobby. On the other hand, if you are doing it for just a hobby or you're just getting started or online is your only option, I think looking at places like Etsy or eBay or even Amazon, depending on what you're looking for, of course, I only work with strictly iridescent so I can't shop on Amazon anymore, but going to places like that can actually be your best bet. So I think I'm going to do an upcoming video on where I would shop online if I had to, to show you guys exactly where I would go. But buying smaller pieces of glass from smaller vendors on Etsy, eBay, Amazon, whatever, is going to be a lot more worth it, I find, and easier than going to these big name companies or brands. Any of those big name places online, it's gonna be stupid expensive. And the more you buy, obviously, the more you have to pay in shipping. It would be a little different if you're buying thousands and thousands of dollars worth of glass at once. But if you're like me, you're only buying a thousand dollars and less of glass, try looking at those smaller places first, especially if you're doing it just as a hobby. But again, hopefully soon I'll be able to do a video and show you guys exactly who I would shop from specifically on Etsy because I do have a favorite seller, but I wanna ask her first before I just throw her name out there. So I'll do a video upcoming soon on where I would shop specifically if I had to shop online. Okay, next question. How do I get designs from my mind into actual paper and into glass? So this is, this is a tricky question. So a lot of the time, if you've watched my other stained glass shopping videos, you know that I get a lot of inspiration from specifically looking at the glass itself. So a lot of the time when I'm going through the glass store, I'm not looking for glass for specific pieces. I'm looking for glass that catches my eye and that I think is beautiful. Then later, I'm gonna figure out what I wanna make with it. So 
again I think I used this example last time if I picked up a blue wispy ripple iridescent glass and looked at it me in my mind I'm gonna think okay what in the real world is made with this color or has this color in it water so then I start thinking of water based pieces maybe some type of ocean view or a seashell or something to do with zodiac signs water zodiac signs so i kind of just let the ball roll like that and kind of let the glass itself dictate what it's going to be made into and how i make my design specifically so as far as inspiration besides glass i get it absolutely anywhere a lot of the time movies and tv my favorite shows or video games can give me a ton of inspiration so right now the holiday season i'm watching tons of holiday movies and all the time i'll see little symbols or even colors or designs that will give me inspiration to make something else then i sit down and try to draw it out so if i want to not forget a design i'll quickly sketch it out sketch them out then later i'll sit down and try to draw them out if you guys have any questions on how i make my stencils i have a whole video dedicated to going through those individual steps i'll link that down below it's super easy to make your own stencils and it's going to make your work a whole lot more unique than anybody else that is going and buying those dime a dozen stencils that anybody else can get you want to make your own stuff if you can i can't draw so if i can do it you guys can do it this is a good question so this is about stabilizing glass or stabilizing your designs now half of me wants to say you shouldn't need this stuff unless you're making huge leaded or lead cane panels but there's stuff called copper reinforcement strips and what copper reinforcement strips is is essentially exactly what it says it's flat strips of a more heavy duty solid copper wire that you can lay in between your foiled pieces to help strengthen it but if you're making smaller pieces less than a couple feet around you shouldn't be needing to use a copper reinforcement strip i would say you need to go back into your, into your design and figure out where it's flawed or what you need more practice with before you start worrying about putting copper reinforcing strips in it because that is something that's a little bit more advanced than the stage of still worrying about having bendy pieces or something do you know what i mean so if you're already on leaded stained glass then you're worrying about strength and not necessarily having bendy pieces anymore then look into copper reinforcement strips that's exactly what it's called and it's just a thick more heavy duty copper foil that you put literally right in between it so say these are our two glass pieces they're both foiled so if we were putting them up against each other the copper reinforcing strip would go right in between it and it just adds that little bit of extra strength that you need okay next question what is my birthday and what's my zodiac sign? So my birthday is June 25th. I'm a Cancer and Aries moon. I could go on forever about that, so I won't. You guys can take what you will with that. So next question, which again is another question I get often, which is kind of shocking to me because it's one of the most popular. What patina do I use? I use Novocan for everything, not just patina. If Novocan makes something, I'm gonna find it in that brand because they just make the most consistent, good quality products i found anyway. I love Novocan. Um, I'm sure, again, you guys know that all of my patina, if I'm gonna use patina, it's gonna be black. I never ever or very, very rarely will make anything and leave it silver. Everything I do gets patina black, I use Novocan. And another question I saw, I believe, was other colors maybe copper or gold or something there are other colors of patina be bronze copper black patina again i'll link everything that i talked about down below in this video in my description box but patina you can have any color you want so for whoever asked about the different colored solder that's patina next question glass paint or liquid lead so somebody had asked about glass paint and i've actually been asked this before and i misunderstood the question but a lot of the times, even in my work, sometimes you'll see even on my snowmans or something or when I make my Nightmare Before Christmas pieces, 
it looks like paint is on the stained glass. It's not paint, it is something called liquid lead. Actually, let me go grab it so I can show you guys what the bottle looks like. Okay, this is liquid lead. So the brand is Gallery Glass, and I'm pretty sure this is one of the, or one of the very few people that even make this stuff anymore. I think this was a lot more pop popular even 10 years ago, but it's Gallery Glass and it's simulated liquid leading. So obviously that is referencing leaded stained glass so when you use big lead cane pieces on the outside or even in between pieces of stained glass this is going to mimic it and it's essentially just a thick paint so it's kind of gray looking and it's super super thick and this will kind of it almost fuses to the glass it's definitely not permanent but it's a lot more permanent than using just any old glass paint or any type of paint and putting it on glass if I needed to do something like this and I couldn't figure out a way to actually work it into the design, then I would use this. I do believe they have this in white and silver. I'm not sure what colors they make anymore. If they have them all, again, I'll put them down in the, the description below. But if you see somebody with what looks like paint on their stained glass, it's most likely something like this. Okay, question number 10, texturizing your solder. So. Some people go in and texturize their solder after they've already laid their initial tinning down and their big, thick bead of solder down. So, say this is our big, thick, rounded bead of solder. You can take your soldering iron and go in and use different techniques to leave lines of demarcation across your solder to give it a different look. So if I took my soldering iron and I went in after that bead is already solidified and just lightly touch the tip all the way down that bead of solder that's going to leave little lines all the way down giving it just a little bit more texture than a plain solid bead would so it gives it something a little different and it's i guess it's kind of the same idea of using a wave foil or a different edged foil it gives it a different look it's something cool to do and if it's done correctly it shouldn't affect the strength of your actual piece okay question number 11 using other materials to outline a piece or adding in wire or when is tinning necessary on the outside of your piece so using other pieces or other materials like wood or lead cane or anything on the outside of my piece is not something that i'm super experienced in so i do not want to talk about that at all but the possibilities are endless just like using lead cane you could put anything on the outside of your piece as long as the piece is structurally sound edging it is just like framing a picture it's not gonna affect the way that the piece has strength it's just going to add a little something extra to it so adding an actual thin wooden frame or lead came or anything else is definitely something cool and different to do but something I'm not yet experienced enough in to give advice on so next part of the question when is more than tinning necessary more than tinning is always necessary so tinning is just the very first step you never want to leave especially the outside of your piece just tinned tinning is just to go in and give it that initial strength to be able to pick up and manipulate however you need to do it to get your piece done no matter what, no edge, whether it's during the middle of a piece or your outside edge should ever just be left tinned. You need to go back in and build that nice, solid, thick, beaded edge up. Not only for looks, but for strength. Tinning will never be en enough anywhere. It should always be a nice, full, solid bead for looks and for strength. Next question, which I thought was a good question. Is glass possible or stained glass possible as just a hobby? and an emphasis on the fact that stained glass shards go absolutely everywhere, it's inevitable. So, short answer, yes. Of course, it's possible to have stained glass as a hobby. I think it's a great hobby, it's so much fun, and to be honest, if you have the money, do it, because it's not a cheap hobby. I wouldn't worry about little things like the glass shards being everywhere, because yes, glass shards does inevitably go everywhere, but as long as you make a dedicated space to making stained glass, I don't see the problem with it. And if you're like me, I clean up absolutely everything every time I finish any step in stained glass. So yes, there's glass shards everywhere, but if you clean it up, it should be fine. If you can make a dedicated space for yourself, I think stained glass is great for just a hobby. It's so much fun. Next question, which again is another question I get a lot. <clears throat> and this is... Uh, Another tricky question to answer. So can you solder after you patina a piece? 
I like to say no. <laughs> you should not be trying to solder after you finish and patina your piece. Patina is last step. You know you're done. You didn't rush it. You should not be trying to solder after you patina. So once you patina your piece, going back into solder is going to put such a strain on the glass and on your soldering iron, it's not worth it. So say if I had a huge window and for some reason I needed to go back in, then yes, I would do it. But every time you try to go in and solder or melt down solder that's already covered in patina, you're having to heat it and cover it with flux so much, you're going to risk not only destroying your iron, but cracking the glass. You're gonna have to get that lead or your solder so hot to initially melt that patina off, it's not worth it. So I like to say, no, I wouldn't do it, so I wouldn't suggest it for you guys either. If you've patinaed a piece, it's done unless you absolutely have to. It's too much of a risk on your glass, too much of a risk on your iron. Okay, almost got done here. Question 14, how to stop pulling at your joints? So this is definitely a multi-part answer. And it's hard for me to say without seeing your work specifically. So pulling at your joints can be a result of many problems. It could be your soldering iron's too hot. What type of solder are you using? Are you still using 50-50? Are you putting just too much solder on your piece in general? Are you capping it before you hit that joint? So it's hard to say. You need to kind of sit back and best judge for yourself. Are you talking about, say, let's this is the top of a piece, we've got a joint right here. If I was going to finish this solder line, I'm gonna cap that end first. So I'm gonna go in, put a little bit of solder at the end of that joint, then drag my solid full bead to the end and there shouldn't be any pulling. If you have solder that's just melting everywhere, pooling up everywhere, it's most likely too hot, too much flux, something isn't right, but you kind of have to look at your case specifically to figure out which one that is. Okay, so next question is any tips specifically on keeping your tip, your tip tinned. So as I mentioned, I believe in my soldering school video, I do think that I use my sponge a little bit more than necessary. So therefore, I think I use tip tinner a little bit more than necessary. Now, I think this person was specifically going in and trying to tin their tip but as soon as they wipe it off on their sponge, it gets wicked gunked up again. So when you go in and you tin the very tip of your iron, you shouldn't really worry about wiping it off, but rather just go right in with your solder and continue to work. The more you wipe off your iron on that sponge, the more or the higher of a chance it is that it's going to get corroded or untinned. So as soon as you tin it, you can either shut it off and let it sit on there or tin it, don't wipe it off and just continue to go. If you're having trouble <clears throat> getting your tip to stay tinned, I would look at an actual tip cleaner or a different type of tip tinner. Because once you melt that tip tinner on, you should be good to go for the rest of that session at least, if you're doing everything correctly. So try to have an unbiased outside look at everything you're doing. Are you using too much flux? Is your foil dirty? Do you have a wet enough sponge? What kind of tip tinner are you using? And kind of make your best call from there. Okay, so another question or I get asked to suggest certain tools a lot. So using branded tools. There is no specific brand for any tools that I really suggest besides iron. So iron, I will always suggest the Hakko FX601 because it's cheap and it's amazing. It's under $100 for the most part and it will last you years and years and years as long as you take care of it. But talking about other stuff like running pliers or nippers, if you use them, any type of normal pliers, even down to foil, there's no specific brand that I suggest. It's just, again, a case of using your best judgment. So if you're on Amazon and you're looking at running pliers that are $5, chances are you're gonna get what you pay for. You wanna have probably 15, 20, $25 and up and checking reviews to make sure it's actually a good piece before you just buy it. A lot of the times, like I said before, you get what you pay for. So if you find a $5 running plier, chances are it's gonna be crap. But with that said, I don't, 
I don't specifically suggest any brand. I have so many different brands of all different tools in my drawers and they all work the same. If it has a curved mouth at the bottom of the running plier, it has a set screw and good solid pads on the front, it's gonna work. It's, it's got one basic easy job, you should be all set. Okay, so this was another question about coming up with designs and intellectual property. So, like always, I always suggest that you guys come up with and use your own designs. Especially nowadays where everything is so readily av available for all of us on the internet, on Instagram or on YouTube, it's easy to look at other people's work and maybe subconsciously even get ideas from somebody else, which is something you wanna avoid. I'll be honest, I don't follow more than two stained glass people on Instagram and nobody on YouTube because I don't want to subconsciously be getting ideas from something I might have seen a year ago on somebody else's page. I just try my best to stay away, keep my mind clear and keep their mind clear if that makes sense. So when it comes to intellectual property, there's a fine line. Yes, somebody can claim intellectual property if it was something very, very specific like Let's use my selenite phase for an example. That selenite phase is a very, very specific, unique design. That's something I could most likely claim intellectual property on and sue somebody for. However, if we're just talking about a basic, uh, I don't know, box or that mountain that every single stained glass artist does for some reason, or a basic crystal design, you can't really get claimed for that but I don't think the objective is to make things based on whether or not you're gonna get in trouble for copying somebody else. Like I say, you wanna strive to make your own designs, to be unique. You don't need to be able to draw to make your own stained glass designs. I can barely, if at all, draw a circle. I can't draw at all. So if I can make stained glass designs, there's no reason you guys can't too. Just sit down and give yourself time. Don't force it out, but you'll be able to come up with your own designs. You don't need to be taking it from anybody else. Then you don't have to worry about intellectual property and all that not so fun stuff. Okay, next question. Why do I not recommend jump loops or chains? So, specifically jump loops and chains is something I will never recommend specifically to anybody. And there's a couple reasons for that. The main reason being when you're buying things like jump loops and chains in bulk online, the quality can fluctuate so much. I don't want to be responsible if something should happen to one of you guys' pieces after I suggest a chain. Say I suggest all, oh, however many of you that watch this, this specific chain, you go and buy it and in two weeks from now it breaks. That makes me feel awful. I don't wanna be responsible for that. Same thing with jump loops. There is such a large, again, flow and variation in quality, unfortunately, with things like chain and jump loops. I'm just not comfortable mass sharing what I think would be best. You just gotta use your best judgment. And again, trial and error. You gotta buy and see what works for you and go from there. Okay, another question is how did I become successful in quotes here, successful at selling stained glass and any tips I have. So, I definitely know without Instagram, I would have nothing. Instagram is the only reason that I'm able to do this. I know I'm lucky in that sense, but I worked hard for it. You have to put in the work, put in the time, and you'll get it too. Consistently posting, upping my quality, being unique, finding my niche, and they came to me. People will come. If you're honest in your work, people will find you. And you're consistent in your work, people will find you. So I think having an outside source of social media can really help garner those sales that you'd need if you want to be a full-time glass artist. Again, if I didn't have Instagram, I'd be nowhere. If I didn't have it, I know I would be working my old job, not working stained glass. That allowed me to do what I do for sure. So try to get multiple streams of social media going all for your business and you should be okay. Okay, last question. Did I get that piece of glass out? Yes, I did. Thank you for asking. Okay, so everybody who brought in their questions, thank you so much. As always, I'm going to link everything I can down below, so check the description. If you want to check out my stained glass work and my stained glass business, that will be linked down below too. And if not, I will see you next time. Bye!